1966, the Beatles grew tired of touring. When their fans were so loud that no one could hear the music, John Lennon said they could send out four waxworks and that would satisfy the crowds. Beatles concerts are nothing to do with the music anymore. They're just bloody tribal rights. People went to see the shaking mop tops and the Cuban heeled boots, rather than the music the Beatles were passionate about creating. On top of that, their lives had been threatened in Japan, the Philippines and the United States in a single year. The only way they could stay together was if they stopped touring completely. They took a three month break. John went to Spain to make How I Won the War. Ringo spent time with his family. George went to India to study sitar with Ravi Shankar. And Paul went on holiday to Kenya with their road manager, Mal Evans. On the plane home, he came up with an idea. What if, for their next album, they weren't the Beatles? They would be free to experiment and sound however they wanted if they made their next album as alter egos. There would be an Edwardian military band. A band that would go on to sell over 30 million copies. More than any other Beatles album. That album was Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Nearly 10 years later, Robert Stigwood, one of the most powerful and successful producers in nearly every area of show business, brought together an all-star cast to recreate the magic of the Beatles' music, the disco generation. The result was a cinematic disaster that frantically swerved between bizarre and tedious. So, why did it seem like such a good idea? And why did it fail so spectacularly? Hello and welcome to Enchanted Essays. I post new film reviews and video essays every Friday, so feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. In this video, I will examine why this movie seemed like such a great idea, and why it failed to replicate the success of producer Robert Stigwood's previous rock opera films. This video is the first part in a two-part series about the Beatles musicals, so be sure to subscribe if you want to see part two. The idea of a Beatles jukebox musical is nothing new. Whilst the Beatles' first two films had songs that were mostly new to the album, they really had nothing to do with the context of the film. In other words, these aren't songs about what their characters are feeling, but are just the Beatles practicing, performing or recording. Even though the title songs are relevant thematically, they're never sung in character. The lads don't break into a hard day's night as they bemoan their frantic schedule, nor do they burst into help as they are being pursued by the antagonists. However, the Beatles cartoon TV series did clumsily create short stories around the songs. Being chased by a jealous boyfriend? Let's sing She Loves You! A vampire lady wants to marry you? Let's sing Babies in Black! We've been abandoned by an alien lady on a distant planet who took us on a day trip with a one-way ticket. Let's sing Day Tripper! The team who made those cartoons are somehow the same team behind Yellow Submarine, which is, as far as I know, the first proper jukebox musical based on the Beatles. Whilst the film does include four original songs, the rest are from previous albums and the film's psychedelic sequences, characters and plot devices are all constructed around the songs. While songs like Only a Northern Song and Eleanor Rigby are just for establishing the mood and their lyrics aren't relevant to the story, others establish characters, such as a man who literally lives in nowhere, or are sung in response to a situation, such as singing When I'm 64 when they become old men in the sea of time, or singing All You Need Is Love as a rebellion against the order of the Blue Meanie's reign of misery. Basically, while some songs were merely the backdrop for some stunning animation that was as experimental as the Beatles themselves, others fit the plot pretty well. It would be another six years until anyone would attempt another Beatles jukebox musical, with the 1974 off-Broadway musical Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band On The Road, produced by Robert Stigwood. The late Robert Stigwood was once one of the most powerful producers of music, stage and screen. Although he would go on to produce Hair, 
Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita, Saturday Night Fever and Grease. He started out in the 60s as the manager of bands such as Cream and the Bee Gees. Whilst he worked with Beatles manager Brian Epstein, going so far as to merge companies with him, the Beatles refused to work with Stigwood multiple times, leading to his departure soon after Epstein's death. Stigwood's first film, the 1973 screen adaptation of Jesus Christ Superstar, was a huge hit, leading him to adapt another rock opera, The Who's Tommy, in 1975. Although a lot of people I've seen talking about the Sgt Pepper movie bring up Saturday Night Fever because it was Stigwood's big disco hit featuring the music of the Bee Gees, I think more direct comparisons can be made with Tommy. Based on what is considered to be the first rock opera, Tommy's film adaptation had no dialogue and an all-star cast, many of whom were only around for a single song. Most of these stars were contemporary musicians, such as Eric Clapton, Arthur Brown, Elton John and Tina Turner, as well as actors such as Jack Nicholson and Paul Nicholas. The cast was heavily utilised in the marketing and it paid off, making nearly 10 times its budget at the box office. As I said before, the Bee Gees were managed by Stigwood for over 10 years at that point, but they had just reached superstardom when they recorded the soundtrack for Stigwood's film Saturday Night Fever smashing chart records that had been set by the Beatles a decade earlier. They had also covered three Beatles songs for the soundtrack of All This and World War II, a documentary that combined Beatles covers by 1976's Biggest Artists with World War II footage. The soundtrack did pretty well, despite the film's failure. Peter Frampton just had the best-selling live album of all time, and Steve Martin's comedy album, Wild and Crazy Guy, reached number two in the Billboard album charts. That's not the comedy charts, that's the regular charts. So, Robert Stigwood had the music of two of the most successful albums from one of the most successful bands of all time. The band that broke the records of that band, the artist with the best-selling live album of all time, and a comedian whose show was listened to by millions of people across the US in a film that would replicate the formula of two box office smashes. What could possibly go wrong? Again, this film was loosely inspired by an off-Broadway musical, but the film was written by Henry Edwards. He had never written a screenplay before, but Stig would hide him because he was impressed by the musical analysis he'd written for the New York Times. Even if I hadn't seen the results, I'd still say that was a terrible idea. That's like asking a film critic to write a rock opera. Just because you're a critic of something doesn't mean that you can create art, let alone art in a medium that you haven't studied. It certainly looks like Edwards would struggle to create a story on its own, let alone one written as an excuse for songs and celebrity guests to be crowbarred in. The story follows Billy Shears, played by Peter Frampton, the grandson of the legendary Sergeant Pepper, whose band was the most powerful weapon in the First World War. Around 20 years after Pepper's death, Billy revives the band with his best friends, the Henderson Brothers, who I will just refer to as the Bee Gees because you will never remember their names, with Billy's jealous brother Dougie as their manager. They get taken to Hollywood and get seduced by record producer B.D. and his girl band, Lucy and the Diamonds, into signing themselves away. Meanwhile, Mean Mr. Mustard is instructed by the mysterious FVB to steal the magical Sergeant Pepper instruments from the band's hometown of Heartland because they hate love and love money. When the town becomes seedy as a result, Billy's girlfriend, Strawberry Fields, goes to Hollywood to get the band to find the instruments and save the town. They take them from the FVB's henchmen a plastic surgeon and a brainwasher preparing the FVB's followers before they go home to hold a benefit concert for Heartland. During the concert, Dougie and Lucy steal the money while Strawberry is captured by Mustard, because he's infatuated with her. 
The band chase them to the lair of the FVB, or future villain band, who are indoctrinating Strawberry along with their legions of followers. Billy kills the FVB's frontman, but Strawberry also falls to her death. As a morning Billy attempts to jump to his death, a magical weather vane turns into Billy Preston and saves him, brings Strawberry back to life, and turns the bad guys into members of the clergy. The end. If the plot synopsis seems like a mess, believe me, it's nothing compared to the execution. It's pretty hard to understate how all over the place the screenplay is. The villains in this film are Mean Mr. Mustard with Brute and his Fembots, Dougie Shears, BD, Lucy and the Diamonds, Dr. Maxwell, Alice Cooper, and the future villain band. Obviously, that's way too many! Jesus Christ Superstar had a small cast of villains from the Bible itself, but they were connected and easy to keep track of. The corrupt religious leaders, the politician, and the traitor. The main villain of Tommy is Oliver Reed's Uncle Frank, who is more of a corrupt and antagonistic presence than in the original album. Uncle Ernie's in the background and assists with Frank's commercialization of Tommy's religion in the second half of the film. Tommy has a few cameo villains, but it's always clear who the main antagonists are. Tommy is finally brought down by his own followers, who are incited by their own frustration at Frank and Ernie's commercialization of Tommy's beliefs. Whilst both of these films have multiple villains, it is clear how they are all connected and it is clear who the main villain is that allows the audience to focus on them. Whilst the Blue Meanies also had cartoonishly simple motivations, it was also a lot clearer. The sheer number of Sgt Pepper's villains prevents us from keeping track of them. The fantastical elements make little sense too. Sgt Pepper's instruments have the power to make dreams come true, which is why they are stolen. However, we never actually see them make dreams come true once in this movie. Considering this is actually set up, maybe that would be a better way of bringing back strawberry fields at the end rather than the weather vane that is just supposed to point towards happiness. Furthermore, it would give Billy and the band something to actually do to change the course of their destiny, aside from getting into fights with Muppet hosts to collect MacGuffins that have no impact on the plot whatsoever. When the instruments are gone, Heartland is broken seedy and full of pinball machines for some reason, like some Sesame Street version of Back to the Future 2. Admittedly, there is a similar plot point in Yellow Submarine, but it made sense. The Beatles bring back music and joy to Pepperland after the Blue Meanies take it away. This is represented visually as colour and movement returns to the Pepperland and its citizens. I'm not saying that everything needs to be explained when it comes to more fantastical elements, but it still needs to make some kind of sense to the viewer. You can't clumsily exposit the abilities of these magical objects through narration and then have them do something completely different. The reason Jesus Christ Superstar and Tommy worked without dialogue is that its songs were written with the purpose of telling that exact story. In fact, Tommy had several original songs and even altered lyrics from the original album to clarify the story further. Two whole songs are literally narration from an unseen narrator. Although the 90s stayed adaptation didn't include these extra songs or lyrics, it is written as a musical and has dialogue between the songs. The film also successfully used visuals to tell the story. Once he is deaf, dumb and blind, he suffers from three traumas. After each of these sequences, Tommy sees a reflection of himself in the colour of each scene. Red, yellow and blue. These finally come together as one white reflection that leads him to the pinball machine that becomes his claim to fame. This makes these scenes feel like more than just episodes in his life, as we metaphorically see how they lead him to the escape of pinball. This also helps to make Tommy less passive as a protagonist after watching several episodes of bad things happening to him which, that he cannot stop in any way. We don't need a narrator to explain this to us. The strength of the symbolism and visual storytelling do this for us. 
There are several songs in the Sgt Pepper movie that do make sense in the narrative. At least in theory. Strawberry singing Here Comes the Sun to Billy is suitable not just because she is waking up her lover, but when she sings It's Alright, she sings it with a hint of doubt. Me and Mr Mustard is a song describing a horrid, dirty old man, so making this an I Am song describing the villain is a great idea. Golden Slumbers works perfectly as a fond farewell to a dead lover, as does The Long and Winding Road. Sergeant Peppers works as an introduction to the returning band, with the subsequent, with a little help from my friends, being an opportunity to establish the band's fraternal bond. She's leaving home, just needs reenacting. You Never Give Me Your Money works as a duet between a gold digger and her thieving boyfriend. Being for the benefit of Mr. Kite mostly works as the introduction to a charity event. Including When I'm 64 as a creepy old man singing to the damsel in distress works despite the change in context. After all, that song was written as a satire of idealised northern domesticity. It's believable that this character would still have this old-fashioned idea of having a woman to knit sweaters for him. And those are really the only songs that properly work conceptually. The lyrics still don't always match, but they mostly work. I Want You does work as both a song of lust and as a song of greed, although the she's so heavy bit doesn't really work here. At first, it's sung about Lucy's diamonds riding past with some bikers, so I guess it's being used as a reference to heavy metal? But then they also use it to sing about Lucy as she's taking pictures of them, and even the expressions on their faces make them look desperate for a thesaurus. Maxwell Silverhammer, a chirpy song about a serial killer, is sung by Steve Martin. In the movie, Martin plays an evil plastic surgeon who makes evil people look younger so that they can be brainwashed by Alice Cooper. The character is supposedly singing his backstory, but the kind of calculating greedy person who would give plastic surgery to the corrupt seems completely different from the kind of wild and crazy guy who would kill people over mild annoyances. I'm fixing a hole just starts out of nowhere. The mayor just starts singing it as a soft shoe number after the band leaves. If they just left it as a cutaway gag with a fantasy bit, it would be fine, but it just keeps going and overstays its welcome. Why is it here? It adds nothing to the plot and it establishes nothing about the character, like many songs in this film. Strawberry Fields, singing Strawberry Fields to Billy, also makes no sense. It's not just because it was originally written about a place. If it was the drug-addled and delusional Billy singing this about Strawberry, then that would work far better. I think maybe the writer included songs that he remembered from the Sgt Pepper and Abbey Road albums without actually going through the lyrics to see if it made sense, especially those of the verses. For example, the chorus of Come Together works as a cult leader drawing in his followers. However, the verses describing someone cool in third person don't fit. Maybe if it were the chorus of brainwashed scouts singing that about the head of the future villain band, it would have worked. But all of the lyrics are being sung by Steven Tyler. The same happens with Get Back as the verses are narrating irrelevant stories. The Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds sequence is just Lucy in the Diamonds singing a song on the billboard in Strawberry's imagination. It feels like the writer went, here's Lucy, here's the Diamonds, and now they are in the sky. It would make far more sense if Billy and the band were singing it whilst they were high and being seduced by the girls, which would also explain the psychedelic lyrics. However, the writer never seemed to take this into consideration. Furthermore, none of the songs, with the exception of When I'm 64 and Maybe I Want You, feel clever with their inclusion. Obviously, I'll explore this more in part two. But Across the Universe was bold enough to use some Beatles songs in a new and inventive way that fitted the story that they were trying to tell. They weren't written with these contexts in mind, but they still worked. Famously, the Beatles producer George Martin produced the soundtrack out of the fear that someone else would fail to respect the songs. 
The result is a mix of Beatles covers with a slight disco flair, replacing the Beatles' innovative studio sound of their later career. On the whole, the result is just… okay. Inferior to the originals and lacking ambition, but mostly perfectly listenable. The best is certainly Aerosmith's cover of Come Together. Mustard's robots sound terrible in both of the songs they are in. The two weakest songs are probably Steve Martin's Maxwell Silver Hammer and Alice Cooper's Because. I did like Because at first, but that's probably because it reminds me of better Alice Cooper songs like Devil's Food and I Love the Dead. I do like Steve Martin, including some of his wackier stuff, but it's all too much here. Yes, this foreshadows his role as another sadistic medical professional in Little Shop of Horrors, but he actually sings in that one instead of comic warbling. Whilst two frontman Roger Daltrey played the title character in Tommy, reprising a role he had played in concert for years. He's either a child or blind, deaf and dumb for over half the film, so the character of Tommy's mother, played by established actress Anne Margaret who made her name in the movie musicals of the 60s, is who we follow for most of the film. Her performance in Tommy got her nominated for Best Actress at the Oscars that year, and she took home the Golden Globe for Best Actress in a Musical and Comedy. And that's a film that includes this scene. Whilst the film isn't carried by her entirely, it's Mrs Walker and the relationship between her and Tommy that emotionally anchors this fantastical story. Roger Daltrey's debut performance as Tommy is good, especially when Tommy is blind, deaf and dumb. They essentially got lucky when they happened to cast a rock star with some raw acting ability. Oliver Reed is convincing as Tommy's corrupt and menacing stepfather, even though his singing falls short. Despite being a great actor, his voice is probably the weakest part of the film. Sergeant Pepper is headed up by Prita Frampton, the Bee Gees and Sandy Farina. None of them become breakout actors like Elvis, Ringo or Roger Daltrey before them. In fact, even the most basic emotions seem alien to their characters. They try to look amazed by grinning and making their eyes really wide and it looks really weird. One of the rumours going around is that their acting was so bad that they came up with a no dialogue idea. The Wall ran into this problem three years later when they realised that Roger Waters couldn't act. Instead of forcing him into something that he clearly couldn't do, they replaced him with Bob Geldof, a rock star that could act, even throwing away filmed footage in the process. If the celebrity cameos are too hammy or too wooden, it doesn't matter because they are out of the film soon enough. But the audience needs a good performance to engage with so that they care, no matter how wacky the rest of the film is. This is a major flaw of the original Jesus Christ Superstar film. When I listened to the soundtrack, I was swept away by the emotion of the characters. However, I soon discovered when I rewatched the film that this emotion didn't translate into Ted Neely's face. This is a real shame because the main appeal of the rock opera is the fact that it portrays those black and white biblical icons into emotionally complex characters. It's why the character of Judas stood out so much more in my memory than Jesus himself. Despite being a great singer, Ted Neely's acting is probably the weakest part of the film. In terms of good performers, Diane Steinberg is a real diamond in the rough here. She hasn't done much else and I imagine that, like Sandy Farina, this was supposed to be her big break. Which is a shame because I really enjoyed her performance. Probably my favourite scene is You Never Give Me Your Money, which she sings with Paul Nicholas because it's the only scene in the film that is competently acted and sung. Also, Donald Pleasance is so different in everything I've seen him in that it just proves what an amazing character actor he was. However, neither of them can carry the film where none of the leads can act. Sergeant Pepper had four times the budget of Tommy, but you wouldn't know from looking at it. This probably went to the stars involved, but regardless, the production design looks so bland in comparison. Whilst there are some creative decisions in Tommy that I still don't understand, 
namely why the rock star Sally Simpson marries as Frankenstein. There is so much that you can read into the production design if you choose to. If you're not interested in that, you can still marvel at the bold and outrageous spectacle. Jesus Christ Superstar went in the opposite direction. Apart from a few wackier costumes for the corrupt characters like Caiaphas and traditional white robes for Jesus, most of the costumes are contemporary clothes, tying in with the theatrical reenactment premise from the opening of the film. The film has little to no set, instead relying on the magnificent and bleak Israeli desert to create a timeless sense of atmosphere. Whilst Tommy's vibrant design asks the viewer to think about the themes, Jesus Christ Superstar's minimalist production instead asks you to focus on the songs, the characters, and the story. In Sgt. Pepper, it feels like the production designers couldn't decide whether to be outrageous or not. I think a more experienced director with a clear vision like Ken Russell could have given the creative team license to go totally insane. Director Michael Schultz had mostly made low-budget dramas and comedies at that time, including Car Wash, which I highly recommend. Although the allocation of budget to their stars was almost certainly out of Schultz's control, maybe he was too used to more naturalistic filmmaking to go all out on the wacky style. So, why did this movie fail to replicate the success of Stigwood's other weird and wonderful rock operas? Simple. They prioritise star power and clout over all artistic merit. Whilst there are a few good songs and performances, nothing can carry this film. It fails on every level, from story to the acting to the design, and sometimes even the music. This is proof that a film cannot survive on clout alone. Have you seen this film? I'm really curious to see if anyone finds it a guilty pleasure. Which song is your favourite? Which creative decision makes you scratch your head in confusion? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you want me to make more content like this, you can let me know by liking the video. I was partially inspired by Elliot Roberts' review of both this film and Across the Universe. He's the guy who watched every Beatles biopic, which is a really interesting video that I recommend checking out. I also recommend Musical Hell's review, which is comedic but still has a clear breakdown of the film's issues. Part 2 will be coming out in two weeks, but before that, I have something else Beatles related. Something you probably heard mentioned in Get Back. So if you're interested in either of those, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to make sure you are the first to watch them. Now, I'm gonna go. I'm going to start the Reggaeton Sucks movement. See you soon! What's going on? What is going on? What's happening? What's happening?